Chris. Hello. Great, great having you with us. Uh, I, I was really looking forward to this one. Um, you know, last last year we interviewed Brett McGuire, that uh, mm-hmm. whom, whom you know very well, right? Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Um, and that was a conversation that blew my mind. Um, yeah, I, mm-hmm. I got to know a field that I was completely unaware of, and mm-hmm. I'm not ashamed to, to say that, <laughs> even though I'm a PhD chemist by training. Mm-hmm. Um, and, um, it, it, you know, it, it's it's been one of those things that you don't want to end, right? But yeah, after a while, mm-hmm. people have better things to do than speaking to me. So we had to we had to close it. Uh, and then, you know, once uh, once he recommended that we could actually speak to you, I said, well, I, I, I jumped on it. I, you know, it's, uh, uh, yeah, I, I hope you can blow my mind uh, as much as he did. Uh, uh, and so no, I hope so, no yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And he also told us that you are uh, quite a good storyteller. So my expectations are pretty high here. <laughs> oh, I'll try not to disappoint. <laughs> okay, good, good. <laughs> All right. So th- thanks thanks for, for being with us. As I said, you know, the way, the way we usually approach this is, is trying to explore, of course, the discipline. And I really want to go there because I... I like. Uh, I know there's a lot of in- incredibly fascinating things you guys are looking into, and and, and you know you can um, you can elaborate um, uh, that they go well beyond you know the the average research in uh, you know in laboratory chemistry that, that mm-hmm. a lot of people do. Um, mm-hmm. But there's uh, there's a, a part that I'm always uh, interested in going into is. Um, is, is the personal aspect, right? Because there is one thing you miss in science most of the time. You know, the people doing the science are a little more than names on a paper, <laughs> yeah? Mm-hmm. And unless mm-hmm. you are really in that field and you know them on a personal level, there's, it's really hard to draw this sort of connection between um, the, the work and the people doing the work. But once you actually get to know the people and you get into the conversation, these, these connections start, start coming across very, very clearly most of the time. And, uh, hey, I can't have enough of that. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. so uh, if you don't mind, we're going to dig a bit into, into your path, right? Uh, mm-hmm. how, you, how you got to be where you are today. And, uh, yeah, let's start, let's start there. You know, how, 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 do you, how do you even think about becoming an astrochemist? That's what you do. Am I, sure. am I correct defining it as astrochemistry? Yes, I'd say that's how I would describe myself, the astrochemist. Okay. Or depending on whether you're coming at it from the chemistry side, astrochemistry or the physics side, molecular astrophysics is two, two names for the same field. Um, yeah, so how did I get into it? Well, I'd say that as a child, of course, I had no conception of astrochemistry. Uh, I didn't know that you could combine chemistry and astronomy in any way. They seem sort of like completely separate areas of science. Uh, I'd say that probably my first scientific interest, uh, one of my earliest ones, was actually in chemistry. I had a chemistry set. I remember uh, one summer uh, getting a chemistry set as a present, and, and that was it was really fascinating. That kind of sparked my early interest in chemistry. Uh, <clears throat> I would do little experiments, you know, as, uh, not following any of the directions, but, you know, it was just, uh, it was a fascinating thing. Um, and... Uh, I'd say later on, I, I became interested in astronomy more and more. I was always interested in space, but but then later on, sort of in middle school, I started to get more interested in astronomy. And so I had these kind of two interests. Um, I had a telescope uh, uh, that kind of didn't overlap, but they were sort of the competing scientific interests of my of my childhood, I would say. It's uh, and, and in fact, looking into your uh, you know your CV, you know your Bachelor of Science was in chemistry and and astronomy. Which is right. uh, yes. an odd combination. Is, is, is he an odd combination as, as much as it seems to me, or is it more common than I might think? No, I think it is unusual. Yeah, I think <laughs> it is unusual. And, and that was sort of my, my attempt. I, I, I uh, did this before I even started in astrochemistry. Uh, but I thought, well, okay, I'll probably major in chemistry. Uh, I thought when I went off to college that, okay, I'll do the practical thing. I'll, I'll, I'll go to medical school, become a medical doctor. Uh, and yeah. I think a lot of chemistry majors uh, have done that or went through, a, went through a similar phase. But then I actually got involved in, in undergraduate research, which was kind of a big moment. And doing that, I thought, okay, this research thing is really cool. I really like that. Uh, I, I think I would like to continue doing research uh, on in graduate school. Uh, again, this is before I even heard about astrochemistry. Uh, I, my first 
undergraduate research experience was actually in synthetic organic chemistry. So real mix and pour chemistry. Which is more my thing, you know, and uh, I will feel more confident to, to, to speak about from a technical perspective, you know. I need to stretch myself and try and speak <laughs> about rotational spectra now with you in a moment. But anyways, <laughs> yes. uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, that's, that's cool. Yes. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah. Just, you know, please, please go on. I, I, I'm, I'm still, I'm still not seeing the step. You know how? Yeah. How, okay. How, 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 well, stumble across it. Anyway. Yes. So I thought, okay, I'm going to major in in chemistry, doing organic, synthetic organic chemistry. So you'd, you'd spend weeks, you know, doing a synthesis, running, doing columns, and and yeah. by the end of it, uh, so we we were working on small molecule medicinal chemistry. You get a little tiny tiny vial uh, with one one little crystal in it one little crystal at the bottom and and you know you then you'd sort of very reverently take this little vial over to the medical school at the university of virginia and give it to the to the uh medical researchers and then they'd see if it had any medicinal effect answer was probably no and then you go back and change a functional group and try it all over again and so <laughs> you described the pain of you know synthetic organic <laughs> chemists and medicinal chemists so well you know it's, it's yeah. sweat and blood on a crystal yeah. <laughs> that it's awful nothing usually most of the yeah. time <laughs> I, I learned doing this uh, many valuable things uh, probably the most important of which was that I as I later learned, I'm not an experimentalist. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so you're enjoying the process at all. <laughs> you know I, 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 I doggedly went through with it uh, let's just say a lot of the product ended up on the bench uh, more than <laughs> I would have liked or in the road of app uh, more than I would have <laughs> yeah. liked uh, and so, but, you know, I thought, well, I still enjoy this more than I think I would enjoy medical schools. So I was ready to just sort of plow <laughs> on and keep doing that. But then as sort of, uh, uh, as chance would have it, uh, something happened, which is how I got actually into astrochemistry. So uh, I attended a seminar, essentially, it was a graduate student recruiting seminar at the university that is part of the, the chemistry program I, ha I had to go to as a bachelor's student. Uh, and it was by uh, uh, one of my professors who was a spectroscopist, and he was talking about uh, doing spectroscopy. Okay, I knew about that from taking physical chemistry, and uh, and then at the end he started talking about doing spectroscopy and astronomy, and sort of in a way that connected the two. And the word astrochemistry was mentioned, and and that just sort of fired my imagination because I thought. You mean there is actually some sort of overlap between chemistry and astronomy? Um, I, I again, uh, as a child, I had this book from 1964. It was from the it's the Life Science Library series. There was a, a volume called The Scientist. You know, it's a, uh, sort of like a, it's a National Geographic issue on the scientist, it's, uh, and they at, they had this sort of chart where they had the the uh, sort of disciplines, mathematics physics, astronomy, biology, geology, sort of, and where they overlapped. So the overlap between biology and chemistry, biochemistry, the overlap between geology and chemistry, geochemistry, the overlap between astronomy and chemistry, there was nothing there. There was nothing there. <laughs> this is 1964. There was nothing there. So, you know, I looked at this book over and over as a child, and I thought, okay, well, I guess there's, there's nothing there. But then I heard this word astrochemistry, and I thought, wow. Uh, so there is actually something there and so I, I that got me thinking well maybe I, I'd like to try that so I actually went to this professor and said hey I'd like to do research with you in this field of astrochemistry and and he did something which I looking back really appreciated he said no you probably don't want to work with me you want to work with this this new guy that we university just hired who actually he does this full-time uh, his name is, is professor Eric Kerbst who, as it turns out is one of the fathers of astrochemistry uh, he had just been uh, uh, moved to the University of Virginia from the Ohio State University. And so I, I went to him. I was his first undergraduate researcher at the University of Virginia. And that just sort of is when my my research career, my, my life really sort of took a, a, a turn that I didn't expect where but suddenly I was, A, not doing experiments anymore, which uh, I, I think uh, the, the organic chemistry lab appreciated to some degree, uh, and uh, doing theory and doing astrochemistry and that's really uh I, I enjoyed it it was really a revelatory experience you know when i was studying at uni um you know i was uh, always thinking how how cool literally i must have been being 
you know, doing chemistry at, at the beginning of it, right? So when mm -hmm. when you were looking into, I don't know, the, the, the initial principles of thermodynamics or the first reactions, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. looking into understanding the elements and the relationships between them, you know, what, well, there was so much to find out, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, mm -hmm. it must have right. been a, yeah. an incredibly exciting time. Yeah. Do, do you get this same feeling? You know, you are you mm -hmm. basically join at, at the beginning mm -hmm. of a new of a new field, right? Pretty much. Yeah. So maybe not yeah. at the super beginning, but very close to it. Yes. You know, uh, it it does feel sort of like uh, what I imagine the early days, as you said, of of uh, organic chemistry or thermodynamics must have been like. In that, we're sort of in the still in the discovery process, where you know we it's sort of like Galileo and the telescope. Uh, it's kind of a one of those moments where all you have to do is look and suddenly you're seeing new things. Um, yeah. And that's sort of what we're seeing is, uh, especially uh, still today, you, you look and you're just sort of seeing new things falling out of astronomical observations. Uh, and all of that leads to the harder job, uh, which is sort of what I focus on, of how do you explain these things? So, so now we've got to go back and we have to try to make sense of, of what we see, which which takes longer uh, to do. Uh, it's, it's an ongoing process, but uh, it's sort of connecting the dots. But but certainly we're still in a stage where discoveries are happening faster than we can really explain them completely. Before you go there, because that's, that's the real fascinating thing, is how mm -hmm. do you make sense of what you see, you know, what... Mm -hmm. what mm -hmm. What, what can you really tell us about where we come from, right? Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. At the end of the day, I, I, yeah, I, as much, for as much as I can't wait, I, I had another question. <laughs> is it, uh, you know, is, is the field, or was the field born from an opportunity? Mm -hmm. So did we mm -hmm. end up mm -hmm. at some point having data <clears throat> Mm -hmm. And that we could l look into from 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 a chemical angle, just because technology at some point got there, or or was the technology developed because there was an interest of looking into this chemical data? And mm -hmm. I, mm -hmm. well, there's a fundamental difference, right, between the mm -hmm. two things. So did it just yeah. happen? I mean, someone mm -hmm. just noticed it, or mm -hmm. uh, have mm -hmm. we gone there in, on purpose? Right. So, so the origins of astrochemistry are really interesting, and it sort of it took a while, I'd say, for astrochemistry. To, to get started. Um, so the first, so, so if you think about historically, you know, the, the late 19th century, early 20th century, you had the, the biggest names in astronomy. So Sir Arthur Stanley Eddington, who is a big, big name astronomer, he didn't actually think there could be any molecules in space whatsoever. He said, starlight, it's going to break them apart. You're never going to have any molecules. And so that was the opinion of, you know, one of the world's experts. That was in, I believe, 1926, he said that. 1937 actually is when we detected the first interstellar molecule. So it's the CH radical. Uh, that was detected uh, by accident. It was detected in, in absorption in a UV vis spectrum towards a star. And that was kind of the first time people realized that, yes, there is this molecule. And not just you know individual atoms or ions uh, in space, but there's this... this chemical bond existing in space. How's that happening? Well, things were kind of slow after that uh, until after World War II. So World War II, you have uh, the development of radar technology and, and its implications for spectroscopy. And you have the birth of radio astronomy, which sort of, so microspectroscopy, radio astronomy that kind of have a similar origin after World War II. And so in, 1960, in the early 1960s, uh, you have uh, the first detection of a molecule using radio astronomy. It was uh, OH, OH radical. Uh, and that really, so things had been sort of building up slowly, you know, detecting a few species uh, every decade or two uh, before that. But after that, with the, the detection of OH using radio astronomy, that's when things really take off, uh, start to take off. I'd say, again, it's kind of slow. You have in the 60s also, you have the famous astronomer Lyman Spitzer working with someone named Bates on, actually, the, that was the first attempt to try to say, okay, how did, how did, these, how did these molecules get there? Uh, it was the first attempt to sort of be quantitative about, uh, about their uh, origins. But it was, it, and of course, because it was the first one, it was kind of, you looking back would say simplistic, but it was, it was uh, sort of a landmark. I'd say in 1969 is when you have really a famous event. That's the detection of formaldehyde in uh, the interstellar medium by Lou Snyder, who's a famous uh, observational astrochemist. Uh, 
And this was really, and now we're seeing an organic molecule in space. This is a major breakthrough. It made the cover of, of Time magazine. It was uh, kind of really one of the landmark moments in the history of astrochemistry. That's when we realized, okay, it's not just these molecules. Ammonia happens around the same time, the detection of ammonia. So you're seeing more and more chemical complexity, even you know, starting with formaldehyde, organic molecules. This is starting to change people's perception of you know, what can exist in space and it leads to the question, the chemical question, how does it get there? How does it stick around? Uh, so this is, I think, uh, so first you have these observations. You start to have very slowly quantitative studies which try to investigate this and, and understand them from a sort of more mathematical, theoretical point of view. Uh, I'd say probably the, the, the real landmark in terms of that happens in 1973 with a paper published, uh, Herbst and Klemper in 1973. That's my PhD advisor. <laughs> so, <clears throat> so that's when uh, he publishes a paper with sort of the first of what we would call an astrochemical model, a sort of modern astrochemical model, where he tries to take all the chemistry that, that people knew about, people suspected might be of importance in interstellar space, and to see, okay, uh, if you if you uh, think about these in terms of a, a, a set, set of coupled um, differential equations, uh, where you're just solving for the abundance of these various species as a function of time, what do you get, and how does it compare to observations? And and that was the first attempt. It was real, and, and it sort of set the tone for what we still do today. And that paper was really remarkable because. In many ways, but one of them is because he identified in that paper uh, the key mechanism that starts the formation of polyatomic species in interstellar space. And it all starts with probably the least expected thing, which is radiation, cosmic radiation. Cosmic rays are really the beginning of astrochemistry. Uh, because if you didn't have cosmic rays, you'd sort of have what you would expect if you, you know, are sort of a thinking about astronomy, you'd have molecular hydrogen, you know, that'd be probably the most most common thing you'd, you'd get. I mean, it is the most common thing you get, but that would be more or less the only thing you'd get uh, if it weren't for cosmic rays. And he identified the mechanism that, that produces that. So, yeah, there's, you know, from, from a normal chemical perspective, you know, out of space, the way you could mm -hmm. imagine it as much as you might know about it, is like a sort of low energy environment. Right? There's hardly anything mm -hmm. there, you know. Exactly, uh, exactly. You how you run chemistry, exactly. you apply energy to me. Exactly, <laughs> so, yeah. exactly. How do you overcome uh, a reaction barrier if your thermal energy, if your, your temperature is 10 Kelvin? You know, KT yeah. is not going to be yeah. very big, and you're yeah. not going to be able to drive very, very many reactions. I mean, we think about chemistry, uh, terrestrial chemistry, as, as we astrochemists call it, terrestrial chemistry. Chemistry. Mm. <laughs> nice. uh, yeah, and, and pretty much every reaction is going to have some kind of barrier that we think about. Uh, but this is just not going to happen, typically, in, under interstellar conditions. Uh, under most, there, there are exceptions, and we can talk about the exceptions later, but typically, especially in talking about gas phase processes, this is not going to happen. You have to have barrierless reactions. So what's going to do that? And from this paper, 1973 paper, Herbst and Klemper, they identified reactions between ions and neutral species, ion neutral reactions, gas phase ion neutral reactions, as being the way that you start to build up complex molecules. And it all starts, it's a very simple chain. Uh, so you have molecular hydrogen H2 and you have molecular hydrogen uh, being bombarded by a cosmic ray. So this is a particle of, of radiation. There, uh, it comes from supernovae or the, the centers of galaxies or star forming regions as we know now. Um, and they sort of get accelerated through the, in the, the galaxy um, and so you have sort of this ubiquitous background flux of, of radiation in space. And so th this is, unlike starlight, able to sort of access, sort of uh, 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 penetrate the entirety, more or less, of a molecular cloud. So if you think about these molecular clouds, uh, photons, especially high energy photons, don't, don't really get through them. So it's like ultraviolet photons, they're right. extinguished in the outer layer. So they're they're sort of dark. And uh, so if you look at uh, uh, a picture of the Milky Way, you'll see these, these patches that are very bright with stars, and you'll see these dark patches. And the dark patches are actually, they're not dark because there's nothing there. They're dark because there's a lot of dust there, and the dust is extinguishing the light at the visible wavelengths and at shorter wavelengths. 
Um, so this ultraviolet light that you know you think could start photochemistry and things like that, not going to happen. But cosmic rays, they are different in sort of the physical mechanism. That, that, uh, and so they're able to penetrate more or less the entirety of the molecular cloud. So you have H2 floating around happily in space. It gets hit by a cosmic ray and it gets ionized. So it's ionizing radiation. Uh, and then you form H2 plus. Well, the H2 plus is not very happy. So once it hits a, another molecule of H2, which again, most abundant molecule in space, it's probably going to happen. Um, then you form this molecule, very important molecule, H3 plus. So H3 plus is sort of, I'd say the central molecule of astrochemistry because it's from this H3 plus molecule that you can start to uh, do chemistry. So H3 plus, if it hits a carbon atom, then you form CH plus. Uh, and so then you can start to have CH plus hitting another H2, and so then building it up to a CH2 plus, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, this is the beginning of organic chemistry in the universe. Uh, so this is, so if you think about organic chemistry, this is sort of the origins of organic chemistry. It all starts with H2, carbon atoms, and cosmic rays. So it, it's amazing. So the, the, the field starts when it becomes an actual science in the sense that there's a sort of formulation of an hypothesis that you try and, and prove experimentally, right? Or with, mm -hmm. with whatever data you have. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it points mm -hmm. towards a, a new chemistry, right? It's, it's a new exactly. way of making molecules, which exactly. is not what we see in terrestrial yes. chemistry. If I exactly. Correctly. Yes, yes, exactly right. Yeah, so then it's, it's gotten us thinking about, okay, which kind, what kind uh, of... So, so, yeah, so what's the origin of astrochemistry? Well, again, uh, you could point to the early observations, which certainly is a major point. You can point to the early quantitative studies, uh, where people like my uh, PhD advisor were looking at how do you how do you get this chemistry? I'd say that that both of those were important in the in the beginning, but but really thinking uh, for my you know of course I'm I'm biased, but I, I think looking at the uh, how do you start the thinking about it quantitatively is really an important step at least in the history of astrochemistry, and and it does reveal, for instance, that these ion neutral reactions these are things which in terms of terrestrial chemistry uh, are often sort of overlooked. I'd say. Uh, yeah, and uh, so, but this is really the central class of reactions for, for gas phase chemistry in interstellar space. And it happens that over time, you actually started finding out that the chemistry, or at least the type of compounds that you see, are fairly complex, and you know, and there's there's a lot of you know variations and, and richness, right? In what in what you find, you keep finding, and which which mm -hmm. is as i said at the very beginning kind of mind blowing to me but it mm -hmm. comes down to a sort of new class of reactions that people mm -hmm. have simply ignored existed until mm -hmm. until mm -hmm. recently mm -hmm. yeah i'd say that that astrochemistry sort of pushes the bounds the boundary of chemistry it's sort of chem so so and th this is what we sort of say often is that the interstellar medium is is a sort of unreproducible chemical laboratory because the right. densities are really low the temperatures are really low the physical conditions are are really extreme uh, in terms of radiation, et cetera. And we can reproduce parts of these in the laboratory. And so there's a, I'd say, so if observations and theory <clears throat> are two of the important branches of, of astrochemistry, uh, the, the third very important and branch of astrochemistry is uh, laboratory astrochemistry, laboratory astrophysics experiments, where you know we try to reproduce one aspect or another of the interstellar medium and study the chemistry there in the laboratory, but we can never reproduce it entirely. And so the interstellar medium, what we're seeing is, is, is ultimately, you know, uh, more complex than what we can reproduce. So the only way we're going to really see it in its entirety um, is just by doing the observations. And so that's why it's such a unique laboratory for studying reactions in extreme environments, I would say. And so that's, that's, that's why you define it as a non-experimental science, because it's mostly well, there, there is there is an element to it because you can reproduce mm -hmm. it in the lab, and that's that's a branch. Mm -hmm. If I understand correctly, you don't necessarily focus on much. Uh, Not my research, but yes, that's a very important branch for astrochemistry. Yeah, yeah, of course. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's <clears throat> with all these sort of open space, right? At, at the beginning, mm -hmm. yeah. Again, I, I I keep thinking about it. it. Must be super exciting, right? How mm -hmm. how do you keep yourself on track? You know, how how do you decide where to go? Feels feels mm -hmm. complicated, right? Because there are so many yeah. things you could potentially look into. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What you know, it, it's it's sort of like you know, uh, pulling up a, a a long route. You know, you start somewhere and then you just keep going, and then you just keep going. Mm -hmm. uh, so 
so let's take cosmic rays, for example. So 1973, that's when we realized, okay, cosmic rays are, are important for gas phase chemistry. Okay, well, you can work continued on studying, for instance, the effects of cosmic rays um, in astrochemistry. And so that's actually a line of research that I, I personally uh, have continued. Uh, uh, so, so now, of course, it develops. What I'm particularly interested in are the effects of cosmic rays and stardust grains. So later on in, in astrochemistry, it was realized that, okay, you have gas phase processes, uh, but another important site of chemistry is on the surfaces of stardust grains. So stardust, as it turns out, is extremely important for chemistry in space. So you have uh, gas phase molecules colliding with stardust grains and the molecules sticking to the stardust. So over time, what does this do? Well, it, it coats the stardust with, you know, for instance, these molecules, which forms what we would call an ice, so it, which has water, but also it has other things, carbon monoxide, methanol, et cetera. And more complex things I can talk about. So what is stardust made of? Just, just my understanding. Yeah. So what is stardust? Well, that's kind of an open question. Carbon oh. uh, silicates uh, are probably the two main constituents. So these are solid particles that somehow come it's, out mm -hmm. of the nuclear reactions happening in the star. So the origin of stardust, uh, uh, if you think, look at uh, uh, stars which are at the ends of their lifetime, so they start to puff out uh, these carbon-rich sort of envelopes, their outer layers. And so this is sort of, I would say, the, the, the birth of stardust. So stardust is sort of born at the end of a star's lifetime, uh, and it sort of wafts its way eventually uh, in, uh, into the surrounding interstellar medium. And, and so, so this is where stardust sort of comes from. Uh, you have, a, a, so the nuclear reactions within a star produce a lot of carbon, which through some mechanism forms this dust, which then sort of enriches the surrounding interstellar medium. And so, and you're at, and this is sort of related to, uh, the work that we've been doing with, uh, with, uh, that I've been doing with Brett, uh, is that, uh, you get not, not just stardust, but you get, uh, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, or you get buckyballs and you get all these other interesting things, uh, yeah. at formed by stars at the ends of their lifetimes. Uh, and so, so this is where you get the stardust. Again, it silicates carbon. You, you could think of them, uh, a, a good analogy of stardust is actually soot. So soot is kind of a, uh, the little fine soot particles. That, that gives you a good idea uh, about what stardust is like, except soot particles are even bigger than interstellar dust grains. Yeah. But it's sort of, sort of a similar thing. And so they're really important because the densities in interstellar space are really, really low. So the, the air that we're breathing has about 10 to the 19 particles per cubic centimeter in it. Uh, a dense interstellar cloud has only a 10,000, 10 to the four particles per cubic centimeter in it. And that's a dense interstellar cloud. And so the, the, the density of these gas phase particles is really low. But if you can get them to stick to the stardust grain, which is what happens, then suddenly you're really increasing the sort of the, the density of reactants. And so you can have a completely different kind of chemistry occurring on these stardust grains. You can have reactants much closer together. You can have all these sorts of reactions that you can't have in the gas phase. And so these stardust grains, so and have, bringing it back to cosmic rays, uh, are just like the gas phase molecules being bombarded by cosmic rays. Uh, and, and this sort of layer of, of molecules, which is stuck to the surface of the stardust, also getting bombarded. And this is doing a lot of chemistry. So from the laboratory, uh, we know that if you take sort of a similar set of materials and you irradiate it, you get, you get a wild array of molecules. Wow. Uh, and so this is happening in space. And this is producing many interesting things. I mean, in thinking about the, 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 the title of this, this podcast series, Bringing Chemistry to Life, this is making... Uh, Biochemical monomers, this process in space, probably. This is making amino acids. This is making probably nucleobases. And so all this is happening on stardust grains due to the interaction between them and cosmic radiation. Yeah, that's, uh, yeah you, you, you're, you're making this mind-blowing as it was expected. So thank you. Uh, it, it's, you know, it, it kind of starts making sense to me. Because, you know, one of the things I was thinking is that, hey, you know, you got a bunch of small... Uh, you know, small molecules and ionized molecules in space, you know, they are really far from each other. The likelihood that chemistry happens when 
when when atoms or molecules collide in some ways, right? That's why mm-hmm, mm-hmm. chemists uh, use use concentration as a as a constant. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You want as many mm-hmm. reactive molecules as possible in a small amount of space. But yes, space right. is really big. Your molecule is mm-hmm. really s- small. You yes, know what's the exactly. likelihood that they meet each other, right? Exactly. Yes. So this 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 start as a sort of way of aggregating and making them closer mm-hmm. together. So the cut, Precisely. It, it's a kind yes. of it, it's not a chemical catalyst, but it's it's, it's a it's a catalyst, yes. though. Yeah, in, in exactly. A way, right? Yes, yeah. in, exactly right. Exactly right. Yes. yes. And, 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 and then you start creating chemical complexity because you have a lot of species yes. together, and then you know the energy from the radiation is, uh, and and that's and that's that's what the unexpected happens. Yes. And there's another important aspect of the stardust grains as well. If you're trying to think about how do you build up bigger and bigger molecules, where if you have two molecules sort of reacting. So remember, we've said that in the gas phase, you're not going to have you can't have a barrier under most interstellar conditions. Yes. And so you've got these exothermic processes. The the product of that reaction is going to have excess energy, which is usually going to cause cause it to dissociate. Yeah. So so. What do you do? Well, if you want to think about how do you get these bigger and bigger molecules, a reaction on a grain surface, you, and you're not going to have three-body reactions in the gas phase uh, in an interstellar cloud, but a grain surface acts as a third body. And so suddenly you can take away that extra energy that the association product has, and you can keep that larger species and then just sort of keep adding to it on the grain. And the grain acts as sort of a, as a, a third body, which is going to take take away that extra energy, stabilize the association product, and this is how you get larger and larger species in, in interstellar space. Is this solid phase chemistry in outer space? Yes, it is. Yeah, yeah <laughs> yes, it is. Yeah. And that's actually one of the things I study is the chemistry, solid phase chemistry on the surface of these, it's a nanoscale solid phase chemistry on the surface of these stardust particles, or once they get coated with this sort of layer of what we call refractory material, so it's water, frozen gases, et cetera, organic compounds, both on the surface of that, and then even within, and this is where the really solid phase chemistry comes in, even within that layer of refractory material. So we call that the, the dust grain ice mantle. And so there's a rich chemistry. So so in terms of thinking about how these biomolecules uh, form, uh, amino acids, et cetera, they're probably, I think, forming within uh, in these dust grain ice mantles. So it's, I think it's real solid phase chemistry driven by cosmic radiation. And and this is exactly what laboratory experiments point to, that you, you, you irradiate sort of similar nanoscale thin layers of refractory material, and you analyze the products that you get, you get these, these, these similar, uh, what we call prebiotic molecules. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I have 10 questions I need to sort in my mind let, let me start from somewhere um, mm-hmm. um, so <clears throat> obviously this becomes all of a sudden very complex and very rich right mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. then your the number of the combinations and you mentioned you know sophisticated mm-hmm. molecules you mm-hmm. can make out of the amino acids mm-hmm. or mm-hmm. you know there's this fullerene type materials right that, that you guys mm-hmm. found in space and mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. A, you know what's What's the what's the objective at some point? Is he understanding mm. the sort of mechanisms, the reactions that happen, or is he finding how further, how much further mm-hmm. you can push this chemical diversity you can find in space, or you know, what, what is the objective? Is it, is it an exploration first, or mm-hmm. is it already? Mm-hmm. Do we have already enough information to start drawing some conclusion as to, you know, what? What, what does it all mean, <laughs> right? Uh, yeah, yes. what happens to these molecules? You know, uh, mm-hmm. is, is there any analogies to the chemistry, to the terrestrial mm-hmm. chemistry, or, or mm-hmm. at least the beginning mm-hmm. of it, uh, and, mm-hmm. and, and what you see in outer space? So I, I think I packed like five questions into <laughs> one, but I let you sort this, this, this mess out. Yes, yes, sure. I, I'd say that it's both, <laughs> that we're interested in both seeing how far, what's the limit of chemical complexity in interstellar space? Uh, and... So how are we doing that? Well, projects like the Gotham project that that uh, that I do with uh, involved with Brett McGuire. So so that's one of the projects where we're actually looking to see what are what are the limits of chemical complexity. Uh, a- another project that I'm involved with, the Carinos project, uh, with a number of researchers. Uh, it's led by uh, Yao Lun Yang, uh, uh, and uh, so this for this project, we're using actually the James Webb Space Telescope or JWST to actually look using JWST at star forming regions, look at 
these ice mantles in ways that we haven't been able to do before at JWST to see directly um, what's in them. Uh, because before this has sort of been a blind spot for, for observational astrochemistry, we've been more or less restricted to looking at gas phase molecules for uh, various technical reasons. And so if we're interested in what's happening on these dust grains, then that's kind of a big shortcoming. But with JWST, we've actually been able to start to look at the, at these dust grain ice mantles, look at the, their spectra. And so we have a paper out now uh, looking at this. And what do we see? We see just sort of, again, this is one of those moments where you, 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 you just look and there's so, so, there's so much low hanging fruit uh, you, that you can just pluck from the data. What we see well, immediately, we see that these ice mantles are, as our models predicted and as we sort of expected, rich in what we call what we call as esterchem as complex organic molecules. So these are this is what what a, a terrestrial chemist would think of as probably simple organic molecules. But but uh, um, but what we see is that they're there. They're there. So we we identified up to tentatively uh, ethanol on these stardust grains, and and we see the broad features of even more complex species. We're still working on the analysis, but. So we see that they're there. So, so what we think is happening is probably happening. So the extending the, our knowledge of the chemical complexity of interstellar space is an important aspect of it for sure. Now, again, going back, there has to be work on trying to explain how do these things get here. So that's another aspect that I'm in, I, I, I work in. And for that, my particular approach is to work closely with the with laboratory experimentalists um, who study these things to try to sort of study in, in sort of these simple systems what the chemistry. So how does chemistry happen in these nanoscale ices uh, for different systems? We're trying to build up sort of a network uh, of, of reactions that we can use then to simulate the chemistry, the complex chemistry of, of interstellar space. But we're sort of going through trying to do it systematically, one system at a time. Um, to, uh, to use our tools to, to really uh, see what's going on, investigates what's going on in solid phase uh, systems. And I think this is another area where astrochemistry is sort of leading chemistry generally, is looking at the chemistry within solid refractory materials. I think this is something where, where astrochemists have made really fundamental advances. Uh, uh, and so be, looking at, for instance, radiation-driven processes in, in ISIS. So when you, when you look at, uh, let's say you deposit a layer of uh, methanol uh, and, and you irradiate it, you're going to see suddenly many products forming very quickly. How does that happen? Things aren't moving around very quickly. And let's say that, you, that the material has been cooled to 5 Kelvin or 10 Kelvin or something. How do you have chemistry happening very quickly at 5 or 10 Kelvin? And this has been something that I've investigated. Uh, what are the physical mechanisms behind that? Uh, and so, again, I think this is sort of an area of chemistry that's being led by astrochemistry because we're, it's something sort of that we're specifically interested in. But it's, it's something that uh, uh, sort of driven by chemistry, driven by astronomy, I'd say chemistry motivated by astronomy. Yeah. And the answer, I think, uh, the, that 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 I believe is uh, happening is you have in this, again, the solid phase, a lot of material, you know, densely packed, the densities are maybe 10 to the 20, 10 to the 22 particles per cubic centimeter. And when you start to irradiate them, you form in a very small volume, reactive species close to one another, they're going to start reacting with neighbors, and etc. And it's this sort of, this sort of reaction in the solid with neighboring species that allows you to very quickly build up more complex molecules, which again, you see in the lab, uh, and uh, it's assuredly, I think, happening in space. So we're trying to understand things on both ends. We use different techniques and different tools to do it, but uh, they're certainly complementary. The slow part, I'd say, is the so going back and trying to figure out, okay, what are the mechanisms? What's the chemistry behind it? The, I mean, the discoveries are happening much faster than we can really explain, explain them right them. now. But, that, but that's exciting. <laughs> so on yeah, the other hand. So. I, I bet. What, what, is, what is the... The, the 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 biggest hurdle you still have in the field from the technological mm -hmm. perspective perhaps uh, mm -hmm. that that you'd mm -hmm. like you like to be overcome that that could give mm -hmm. you that that yet yet an extra edge right for yes for for, yeah. for the next next level of discoveries what would that be yes i'd i'd say that probably in astrochemistry one of the limiting factors is laboratory work so experiments okay. take time they're expensive 
Uh, but the data they produce are both necessary for the sort of theoretical techniques that I use, as well as for observations. And so, uh, so I would say that uh, that that's kind of the bottleneck. The, you know, studying reactions under these extreme conditions it, it takes a lot of time and skill and expense because these the experimental uh, uh, sort of setup is a, a very unique uh, to, yep. to vacuum chambers, etc., uh, spectrometers. All these are very uh, sort of um, things that, that take a lot of time to to to, uh, to do and so i'd say that's probably the bottleneck is is sort of uh the laboratory aspect and it's very important there aren't too many groups doing it uh so it's but, but they do very important work so it, i imagine that this is tricky because it, as you say mm -hmm. it's expensive and it's real fundamental science so it's probably yes, the yes. funding is a, a potential issue there right yes exactly right yeah so studying sort of kinetics and studying these other aspects of uh, chemistry under conditions relevant for interstellar space, again, is is, is necessary, uh, but uh, it's it not as common as, as, let's say, synthetic organic chemistry. So. Yeah, yeah, of course. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, what has been the the most surprising discovery that you have made? Or I mean, uh, maybe I can extend the question. Mm -hmm. what, what has been the most, uh, or at least one of the most su surprising discovery of the field in in general? You know, something that you know, from your perspective or being more of an insider and an expert is, 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 is mm -hmm. really, mm -hmm. is, is really potentially mind blowing, not just for, for a newbie like me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'd say probably the, the mind blowing thing is that again, if you, if you think about astronomy and chemistry sort of naively, you think about, uh, molecules like H2. Um, so the mind blowing thing has been to see just how complex molecules in interstellar environments can get. So, uh, so for instance, we detected uh, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons of benzonitrile uh, and, and the, the, uh, cyanonaphthalene uh, in uh, interstellar space with the Gotham Project. Uh, and so this has been really shocking that, that, that we've detected molecules like that. And I think that if you look at meteorites, if you analyze meteorites, for instance, you can extract from them amino acids, you can extract from them uh, nucleobases, things like that. So they're forming probably, or at least their immediate precursors are forming in interstellar environments. Uh, this has really been kind of a, a shock. I'll say as well, so there is a, the Comet 67P CG, uh, which we sent a, a, a probe to, and there's a lander as well. This is the Rosetta mission. And in analyzing the material coming off of the comet, uh, one of the things that was detected was glycine wafting nice. off of this comet in interstellar space. So I'd say that, that, that kind of really confirmed that these prebiotic molecules are out there. They're forming in interstellar space. Uh, and so it just raises lots of fascinating questions about, is there a connection between interstellar chemistry and the origins of life? Because right. you think about the development of solar systems, which again, another mind blowing recent development in astronomy, which sort of, and this touches on astrochemistry, have been observations of star and planet forming regions. So these molecular clouds that we, we observe, they start to collapse and start to form stars. And one of the things that, that happens when you have a, a star forming, it's going to be about the mass of the sun is that you get planets forming just as sort of a byproduct. So you get stars and planets forming sort of together. And so they're forming from the same material at the same time. And so all these molecules that we're seeing somehow are going to end up one way or the other uh, on these developing worlds. And can that sort of kickstart the development of life, especially if there are these prebiotic molecules? I think that's a, a very exciting sort of and suggestive uh, discovery that has been made uh, that a lot of research is being uh, directed towards uh, investigating. So what you're saying is that the, the chemistry that we observe on the planet uh, uh, is, is most likely uh, started from a more complex starting point that, that we, we originally thought. It's not that everything developed on, on, on planet Earth, but or whatever, on each planet, but um, you know, the reality is that there was a lot, a lot of uh, different species uh, at, at the very beginning. And that, that's, that's kind of a difference so starting point, mm -hmm. an initiator for the chemical complexity we observe and life possibly. Exactly. So stars and planets, let's focus on planets. Planets are forming from material, which is already very chemically complex as right. we now know. And that, okay, so a lot of, a lot of processing happens as you're 
building a planet. Uh, but you have sort of a continuous sort of bombardment of uh, sort of comets containing all these organic molecules uh, all throughout the early stages of, of planet formation. Uh, and so you have this sort of constant stream coming from the surrounding material, uh, uh, rich in these uh, molecules which have formed long long before the, the planet had started to form. And so I think that that's really been an interesting discovery. So the idea is that potentially amino acids could have happened, you know, could, could have come on, on the planet from some comet somewhere and then being the initiator of the fundamental chemistry of life. For is, is that, is this that is one certainly of the an idea. Yeah. Exactly. Certainly an idea. Because we, again, from the comet, uh, uh, so from the results from the comet, we know that at least one amino acid and probably more uh, are forming in space. And we know certainly that, that in the, again, in the early stages of, of, of the planet's history, there's going to be a lot of bombardment. A lot of this material is going to make its way to the surface. Might some of that material find a suitable environment where life could begin? I think this is a question and this is uh, an interesting avenue that a lot of people are, are looking at. Do we observe chirality in, in outer space? Mm. Yes, that, that, so that's, that's a very good question. So, so Brett McGuire was the first person to observe a chiral molecule, so propylene oxide, uh, in space. Now, we don't know which enantiomer it was, we, uh, but so that was the first observation of a chiral molecule. However, uh, if you think about meteorites, so again, I've, I've mentioned that you can extract amino acids from meteorites. Uh, if you look at the, the enantiomeric composition of those amino acids, there's actually an excess, a slight excess of the enantiomer used by biological organisms. <laughs> Why is that the case? I don't, yeah. it's, that's an open question, but that's, what, that's what's been observed. And so that's another very, I'd say, suggestive connection potentially between what's happening in interstellar space and, and the origin of life. So there are, that, that's a really remarkable finding that was made uh, looking at this chemistry. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, as, 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 as you, you keep throwing at me mind-blowing things. It, 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 yeah, this, this, this is amazing. Well, what's, uh, what's the utility of it, right? Obviously, mm -hmm. Hey, you don't need to convince me. I completely understand, right? But if if, if you <laughs> had to sell the the discipline, mm -hmm. you know, it, mm -hmm. it's obviously mm -hmm. fundamental understanding of the universe and basically what what, what we mm -hmm. are potentially, right? Mm -hmm. But um, is there any practical application that has has come from or has the potential mm -hmm. to come from the <clears throat> discoveries in industrial chemistry? Mm -hmm. Right. Yes, I would say as I mentioned, the interstellar medium is a really unreproducible chemical laboratory. So by looking at chemistry in space, we're looking at chemistry in an environment and over time scales that we can't fully reproduce anywhere on Earth. Um, so I think that's a, by itself fundamentally interesting. But I think that also, again, at, sometimes astrochemistry drives certain subdisciplines in chemistry. So thinking about uh, neutral reactions, thinking about solid phase chemistry, I think this is, these are areas where advances in astrochemistry can have real impacts in other fields of terrestrial or applied material science chemistry. So I think that uh, questions motivated by astronomical problems, they can have these sort of real implications in, in other, other fields. How much you guys use available uh, spec spectroscopic data coming from, uh, you know, instruments that are necessarily dedicated to astrochemistry, but you mm. know, looking at outer yes. space or how yes. much mm -hmm. are you mm -hmm. actually sort of generating a, 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 an observation, uh, you know, using, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I know who owns yeah. this, this equipment, I suppose, <laughs> you know, government entities like NASA or whoever, right? Mm -hmm. uh, how, how does that work? Where is the data yeah, we coming from? Yes. So in terms of laboratory data, of course, spectroscopic data is very important. Yeah. And from laboratories, of course, so, so, so we're looking at, for instance, the rotational spectra of various molecules. It doesn't have to be specifically geared towards astrochemistry. Uh, and so there, I think that's one area where we certainly do and, uh, work very closely with, with uh, experimentalists. So, uh, for instance, Brett McGuire has done uh, does rotational spectroscopy. Yeah. Uh, and we work cl very uh, closely with with uh, researchers in that area. In fact, astrochemistry, I mean, it sort of grows out of spectroscopy in a lot of ways, mm -hmm. uh, th thinking about its origins uh, 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 with microwave astronomy or radio astronomy. Uh, and uh, so I think that that's, one, that, that that's one area where there's a really fruitful sort of 
interdisciplinary collaboration. And indeed it's necessary because you, you need the, the, the spectrum in order to observe the molecule. And so this is a, a particularly uh, rich area for, for that, that uh, has benefited astrochemistry. I, I cannot think about that, that discipline uh, that doesn't really need much external drivers for finding inspirations because mm-hmm. you've got plenty there, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. But um, is there going back to you know the personal connection to the science? Is there mm-hmm. what is your way of thinking? Is there um, uh, is, is is there anything you rely on or anything you do besides your sort of everyday work that mm-hmm. is helping you sort of finding new directions or ideas or or is it all well, you know, is this such, such, such an inspiring field you are? That you, you might not even need this. I'm, I'm kind of kind of curious here. <laughs> sure. Well, I think it's it's certainly it is an inspiring field, but uh, I, I I think. Uh, so- I, I have actually I have too many other interests that sort of uh, <laughs> occupy my my whatever free time I have. Uh, so film photography is one of those. So I uh, uh, really enjoy that, and and film astrophotography as well. Actually, uh, I think that uh, there's chemistry there. I see the rocks. There's chemistry sorry. there, <laughs> exactly. So that's another way of combining <laughs> chemistry and astronomy uh, in a way that that's really fun. Uh, and, and and I think that you know as an astronomer, it's really easy to sort of uh, kind of get jaded so uh, about sometimes how, just how cool, you know, what we right. do is because we do it every day. And so sometimes, you know, you think, okay, another day thinking about space. <laughs> and so, but so, you know, sometimes just stepping back and, and, and uh, just looking up at the night sky, you know, with not with the James Webb Space Telescope, not with uh, the Green Bank uh, Telescope, which is one that we use for uh, the Gotham Project, uh, 100 meter radio telescope, but just just with a small, simple telescope is a way to sort of kind of refocus on, and and just to re-experience just how cool all of this is. And and again, combining that with my with film photography is a way to just uh, connect it to chemistry in a different way, in a very kind of hands-on way. You know. I can I can completely see you know how. <laughs> you know, you can find an artistic perspective on all these mm-hmm. or, or even a mm-hmm. philosophical one, right? I mean, there's probably, yes. probably plenty of angles for that that mm-hmm. is hard to find in, 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 in many other, uh, you know, chemical disciplines, you know. Mm-hmm. You probably mm-hmm. need some philosophy to cope with your failures of, you know, <laughs> the laboratory chemistry if you do synthesis, but, <laughs> you know, I, I guess yeah, it's, a com- yeah, it's a completely different yeah. ballpark, right? Um, yes. Uh, yeah, it, it, it's interesting and, and uh, mm-hmm. no surprise. So do, do, do you consider yourself like a meditative type? You know, you're looking at spectra all day, you you know, you yeah. look at the sky, you know, is it? Is it, is it yes, is I think. I think that the, the, that's certainly an important part is, is, is to be a little bit meditative and to think about, yeah. okay, uh, to have a little bit of an appreciation for the philosophy of science because, yeah. again, we, we can have uh, models that uh, uh, can potentially explain the, the observational data, but are they correct? So you can have more than one model explaining a, a, some set of data, but you know, they might be mutually exclusive. So thinking about that and being kind of sensitive to, to, to those sorts of things um, is an important aspect when we're trying to explain what we see, is that just to realize, again, that there can be more than one way. Of course, nature does it in one way, uh, and that's what we're trying to get at. Uh, but that, you know, we may come up with something which fun- works from a functional point of view, but isn't actually getting at the physical processes that are actually occurring. So I think uh, having a little bit of, uh, of, of humility when it comes to, okay, we've got, we, our models are doing well. Did we get it right? Well, hopefully, you know, and, and with more data, more observations, uh, you know, we, science is sort of like a crossword puzzle. We pencil things in and, and try to fill out this crossword puzzle of nature and the more sort of surrounding uh, sort of answers that we're able to fill in, the, the the more confident we can be. But I mean, again, in a field like astrochemistry, we're kind of kind of in that corner of the puzzle that 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 has been neglected uh, for a while. <laughs> so you know, we we end up we're, we're we're using pencil, not not pen. We're sort of putting things in, and sometimes we have to erase them. So I think that uh, again, being a little bit contemplative uh, uh, and understanding the limits of you know uh, of of what we're doing. Uh, and and with the data that we have, it certainly is very helpful here. Do you foresee the field becoming 
bigger? And what, what would it take for it to become bigger? Mm, yeah, I think it certainly uh, is, is growing and will continue to grow. And I think a big driver of that will be JWST and the observations that come from that. I think that that's really going to expand our knowledge of these dust grain ice mantles and the rich chemistry there. Uh, I think that, again, there are uh, more and more people who are becoming aware that there is, in fact, a connection between chemistry and astronomy. And this, like it did for me, really excites a lot of people and, and inspires them. And so I think the field will continue to grow. Uh, and and uh, yeah, I, uh, both the, the observational side, theoretical side, and also the experimental side. It certainly does inspire me. And um, uh, what does it take to coming to, you know, the end of our chat, uh, mm -hmm. which has been, again, I'm going to have a lot to think about tonight, but it, <laughs> it, 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 you know, I, I, I always close with, you know, the, the same, the same question on all, mm -hmm. all the interviews and I, and I, and mm -hmm. I like doing that. You know, I, mm -hmm. I guess there's a lot to inspire young students, right? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and and I, and I'm and I'm sure a lot a lot of people would be you know ex excited to jump into this sort of science. But, you know, mm -hmm. uh, anyway, you know, you you've been through a path. You know, you're now in a very interesting place. And, you know, you're enjoying uh, your role in a in a growing community, doing important discoveries, and you know, being at the early days of of a field and feeling incredibly excited about it. Uh, um, is this something you would recommend to somebody else? Uh, and mm -hmm. uh, and if you had to stop and look at your experience, you know, what would be a, a piece of advice that you would pass on to somebody who's just starting now? Mm -hmm. I would say, don't compromise on your interests. If you if you're interested in chemistry and you're interested in astronomy, there's probably you know in the case there is a field astrochemistry which combines them. But you know, I think we think about these narrow sort of disciplinary boundaries sometimes as being really rigid or more rigid than they are. But I think these disciplinary boundaries say more about how science has developed historically than about nature. Now, nature is a continuum. And so everything sort of ultimately blends together. So I would, I would encourage young researchers to uh, not to compromise whatever you're interested in. There's probably an interdisciplinary field that combines them. Uh, and if there isn't, then you could probably make it. Uh, and so I'd say that, you know, if you're doing something you're, you're, that, that combines as many uh, passions as possible, that's really what someone's going to find enjoyable and really what they're going to excel in. It's a great way of closing a chat. You know, the most exciting science always happen at the, at the, you know, at the interface. You know, mm -hmm. the interdisciplinary mm -hmm. science is, is the most exciting one almost all mm -hmm. the time. Uh, mm -hmm. Chris, it's been... Fantastic. I, I, I've, I've enjoyed this a lot. Uh, and it's been a lot of fun. Thanks again for being with us. Uh, and uh, all the best for the future. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep an eye on what you guys are doing there. And, and perhaps we'll have an opportunity to invite you again and, and see where you're going, uh, where you're going with the field. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Thanks, Chris.